So my name's American. I'm the teacher of this class, Dark Matters, um, Critical Theory of Technology at the School for Poetic Computation. Um, for those that aren't familiar, School for Poetic Computation is a school that does classes across technology, um, theory, poetry, um, sort of interdisciplinary, bringing together a lot of different knowledges in a creative way. And I've been teaching this class. This is the fourth time I think that I'm teaching it. Um, and each time we've also had some sort of culminating publication. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and now I'll, I'll pass it to Zay for a sec. Hi, um, I'm Zayna Value. I go by Zay. Um, today I'm calling in from stolen Lenape land. Um, in this time I've been feeling quite distant from some of the ways that I would typically describe myself. Um, but most recently I've been um, a learner, a teacher, um, a hacker, a daughter, um, and a designer. Um, I had a privilege of being a student um, in the 10 week immersive session last fall. Um, that's where I met American. And for the last 10 weeks, um, alongside American, we have been stewarding and teaching this class over Zoom. Around 32 students have called in from all over the world to study alongside us and each other. Um, and we've been engaging in intimate practices of unlearning, deep listening, and reflection. And most importantly, we have been studying beneath the university, um, which is a framing I borrow from theorist Fred Milton. And the title of this critical theory class is Dark Matters, Blackness, Surveillance, and the Whiteness of the Screen. Um, and it shares a namesake with a book by Simone Brown um, titled Dark Matters um, on the Surveillance of Blackness, which is the primary um, text that we read. Yeah, and to give a little bit more context around the syllabus and what we've been reading, um, as they mentioned, Simone Brown's book, Dark Matters, sort of became the, I guess, the foundation for the thinking through the class. Um, and it's probably the text we read from the most. But we, we began the, the semester reading um, an essay by Wendy Chun, um, alongside an essay by myself called, called Black Through the Universe. And those essays sort of thought through how technology hides itself and the obfuscation of technology is sort of reflective of um, obfuscation in society as a whole and thinking around ideology, um, using a film like The Matrix, which is really sort of um, corny in a way, but is also a really good analogy for how we think about technology in society. Um, and then we also looked at the history of Silicon Valley in relationship to settler colonialism in the United States in technology. Um, thinking through connections between the military industrial complex and technology and the university industrial complex. Um, and then also looking at blackness and surveillance, um, racialized surveillance, um, and also policing and policing technologies that are also racialized technologies. So sort of finding a way to bring together a lot of these really heavy topics that affect us on a daily basis in many different ways, um, finding all the overlaps between those things. And something that was really unique about this class um, because of the time that it took place and also why it was online um, was in response to the pandemic. So um, once that sort of happened, SFPC was working to find a way to offer these classes remotely, which ended up having a positive outcome because a lot of people could take the class that normally couldn't take the class. Um, but it's also interesting because many of the topics we talked about in the class uh, really resonated with what was happening on a nationwide and worldwide scale, both in terms of thinking about um, a pandemic or quarantining um, along the lines of um, policing or captivity, and then thinking about Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter protests alongside um, the economy and critiques of the economy and um, people mobilizing against that. Um, and then also having to be on Zoom, which is an inherently not necessarily safe platform to be on, but thinking about that as a means of surveillance as well. 
um, and differential surveillance, surveillance that has more power over some people than others. Um, and then also just thinking about institutional accountability, which has come up a lot with the Black Lives Matter protests, but also thinking about um, having a critical um, awareness of the School for Poetic Computation itself as a school and thinking about um, what it's fair to ask for from an institution. So in all of these different ways, everything we've talked about in class has, has had a connection with everything that's happening on a real world scale. Yeah, and I think um, for me mostly, I think for a lot of us, Dark Matters reminds us about these dominant models and codes that construct the world that we live in, um, like their underlying ideologies, as well as our need to consistently critically interrogate these systems. Um, and this class has given us intentional time to tend to ourselves as we contend with these infrastructures that are governing us, um, to study the material while we're existing within the systems that we're just learning to name. Um, and so together we study theory, but theory is nothing without the lived experiences that inform it. Um, so like American mentioned, um, our experiences of COVID, um, the ongoing movement for Black lives, um, and our relationships to institutions of violence continue to be part of the conversation and it's largely affected how we share, create, and relate to one another. Um, and through our co-learning, we can better understand how these structures are compromised and that helps us to begin to imagine strategies for future resistance um, and what an outside to these structures might actually look and feel like. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what we came together to make. Um, so throughout the length of this course, we've been engaging in models of self-publishing um, and breaking down distinctions sorry, of um, knowledge production, something that I'm personally really interested in. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and so this is a collaborative dictionary um, that is an assemblage of poetry, prose, um, creative writing, personal histories, and illustrations um, made up of terms that we've come across while unlearning together during our Dark Matters class. Um, every voice within the dictionary is uniquely represented um, with the author's preference in typography. Um, by archiving our histories and inserting our dark experiences into the critical theories we're learning, we're looking inwardly and actively engaging with the way that we move in the world. Um, and it feels increasingly necessary, um, helping us to not only ask about the technologies, processes, and policies that govern um, civil liberties, but also about whose bodies and whose freedoms are most controlled and policed. So this format, um, as I mentioned earlier, we've been doing some kind of culminating zine for every iteration of the class. And with this one, um, sort of like Zay and I have been talking about it for many months now and sort of planning, but it began with thinking about how um, the publication could be a little bit more generative. So rather than every student working on like a final perfect essay, it would just be this like gradually evolving collection of knowledges um, that would just be expanding and we could sort of design more, more of like designing a context where all of this knowledge can live within and that would be the final publication. Um, and I think it turned out amazingly um, and they could um, say a little more maybe about the, how we used ARENA to um, Put this publication together or maybe save that for another time because we're getting a little late on time but um but basically i'm really excited because this publication has gotten really lengthy and we're now at around 500 pages which i think is really cool um and this will be available in print um for people that want to purchase it probably within the next few weeks and if you are interested in getting a copy I would suggest following SFPC on Instagram. That's probably the best way to get notified when it happens. Um, and um, I also want to briefly thank a lot of people who made this session possible. So I want to thank Lauren Gardner for her amazing support through this whole semester and School for Poetic Computation 
at large for making this happen. Um, and I want to thank our guests that came through for um, some additional support through um, guest, guest events, including Simone Brown, Stephanie Dinkins, Ingrid Burrington, Rashida Richardson, and Zach Glass. Yeah, and we also want to thank um, some of our friends at Arena um, and beyond. Um, so Khalil Capuzzo, Mindy Sue, um, and Kav Bukowski um, from Arena from helping to support to develop our publication. Um, and I think now we're ready to proceed with the reading. Um, and we thought it would be great to kick off the reading with terms to help define what our publication is titled. Um, so a dictionary of dark matters. Um, I will share my screen again. And I would like to start by um, defining the term people's dictionary. Um, an infinitely capacious, colorful lexicon of voices giving meaning to the breadth of our collective lived experiences. An assemblage of knowledge established within our mutual histories, liberated from predestined meaning, where there is no mandating of prescriptive language, nor any other tools of the elitist and colonial literary industrial complex. Toni Morrison reminds us that oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. It does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. A people's dictionary is a subversive inquiry into the constraints of language and the other inherently oppressive structures which hinder our potential to imagine the beyond. It asks questions like, which experiences inform theory? What is intellectual authority? Who gets to dictate what it means to be human? And I would like to pass it on to American who will be defining dark matter. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. So this is a, a definition or, or more of a just a discussion of dark matter that comes from Simone Brown's book. And I just wanted to read it because I think it's really complex and beautiful and really describes a lot of the things that came up in class. So to quote the book, the concept of dark matter might bring to mind opacity, the color black, limitlessness, and the limitations imposed on blackness, the dark, antimatter, that which is not optically available, black holes, the Big Bang Theory, and other concerns of cosmology, where dark matter is that non-luminous component of the universe that is said to exist but cannot be observed, cannot be recreated in laboratory conditions. Its distribution cannot be measured. Its properties cannot be determined. And so it remains undetectable. The gravitational pull of this unseen matter is said to move galaxies. Invisible and unknowable, yet somehow still there, dark matter in this planetary sense is theoretical. If the term dark matter is a way to think about race, where race, as Howard Wynett puts it, remains the dark matter, the often invisible substance that in many ways structures the universe of modernity, then one must ask here, invisible to whom? If it is often invisible, then how is it sensed, experienced, and lived? Is it really invisible or is it rather unseen and unperceived by many? In her essay, Black Holes and the Geometry of Black Female Sexuality, Evelyn Hammonds takes up the astrophysics of black holes found in Michelle Wallace's discussion of the negation of black creative genius to say that if we can detect the presence of a black hole by its effects on the region of space where it is located, where unseen, its energy distorts and disrupts that around it. From that understanding, we can then use this theorizing as a way to develop reading strategies that allow us to make visible the distorting and productive effects of Black female sexualities in particular and Blackness in general. And with that, um, I want to pass it to the students for the remainder and all of them will share a little bit of what they've contributed to the publication. Hi. 
Uh, I'm Angus. Uh, my pronouns are he, they. I am on unceded uh, Wolsequik and uh, Mi'kmaq territory. Um, I uh, would like to read a couple of uh, the things that have sort of come up in the time that I've spent uh, learning with everyone else in this class, um, especially around the uh, the production of tech culture and and uh, its inherent power structures and how often even positions of resistance seek to negotiate with uh, with systems of oppression rather than uh, abolish them. So um, I'd like to start with uh, a collaboration um, between uh, myself and Miranda, uh, who um, will uh, read uh, Predatory State. Hi everyone. Um, so I'll start off. Um, predatory states. We're living in the room of precarity. I still have the math text textbooks that I had to buy with the key at the back so you wouldn't have to hire teaching assistants. We're on the verge of liberation. I'd rather remember the books that went to friends and came from them. We're credited by the invisible tracker in the shadow. It asked me, what is your financial condition? The collections agencies still call me with robots to try and trick me into saying my name. And how are your ties to the community and family? Memories of spotting my brother for a bus pass so that he could go to work and go to court. I smiled and frankly answered sent me letters with law firm letterheads, and we both know that that was a long time ago. I'm being entangled with the idea of progress. We are all resources. You may have diminished expectation from me. I'm not going to invite them in. So, can we live together without harmony or conquest? I smile, a smile of blood. It's disturbingly alluring. I feel my instinct calls me to react. I hold my breath as I observe. The wind blows convergingly towards me, and I cannot help to close my eyes as a voice commands and to protect me. I shall not fear. Conversations and kind words and meals and art, bonds made by mistakes and excesses and gossip. The room turns into a mosaic art piece. It unfolds itself with patches and detachments. Nothing is neutral in the art history, but an ascetic choice. Being caught up in and by default, living in risk without calculation. Thank you. Okay. Um, Next, uh, a couple of things to start that just come from uh, my background. These are things that I brought and things that became complicated uh, as we learned more. Um, so this definition is William Shockley. Most commonly, we're taught that William Shockley was the Nobel Prize winning father of the transistor. Second most commonly, we're taught that he was a bad enough boss and colleague that he was indirectly responsible for the founding of Fairchild's semiconductor arm and perhaps the semiconductor industry. Rarely do we remember that Shockley wrote a report suggesting a mainland invasion of Japan would result in more casualties than the use of the atomic bomb. He became an ardent eugenicist and race scientist and stands today as an, an emblem for technologists' willingness to celebrate techn technical achievement and readily forget de-emphasize or legitimize enthusiastic partition or participation in systems of subjugation and oppression. So this is another one that I brought with me, um, hierarchy. In software, an arrangement of classes, modules, or functions by their calling or property relationships. In societies, an arrangement of power relations determining what people are able to say and do and what people limit the speech, action, and agency of others, patriarchy, white supremacy, heteronormativity, cisnormativity. 
The use of deep hierarchies is an anti-pattern and is considered harmful in the implementation of your software project or society. This um, came as a result of, of some of the work that we've been doing. Um, this definition is called physiognomy. A physiognomy of physiognomers. Aristotle looked like a physiognomer. Pythagoras looked like a physiognomer. Polemo looked like a physiognomer. Adamantius the sophist looked like a physiognomer. Michael Scott looked like a physiognomer. Johann Lavater looked like a physiognomer. Cesare Lombroso looked like a physiognomer. Louis Corman looked like a physiognomer. Roman Q, Clark K, Morarity, Hair World Detection and the Sexual Orientation in Human Males, Behavioral Neuroscience. Justin M. Carre and Cheryl M. McCormick, in your face, facial metrics predict aggressive behavior in the laboratory and in varsity and professional hockey players. Yamaguchi M. K. Hirokawa T. Kanazawa S. May 1995, Judgment of Gender Through Facial Parts, Perception. Cursory analysis shows that physiognomers have a high probability of being statues, founding the equally fake sounding science of criminology. Headline A folder full of hockey players, and nobody in their life they can run an idea by. How am I doing for a time? I think we can pass it on to... Okay. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, it's all good. But thank you so much, Angus. Next, we'll have Cameron. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Cameron. I uh, use he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm going to share, sorry if I'm looking down, I'm looking at my notes app. Um, I'm going to share three different definitions. Um, one of the things that really struck me the most with the class was um, seeing how, uh, how present our, or I guess really how reflected our biases are our human biases into the programs that we use um, and also how those kind of um, reinforce or I guess reify those biases moving forward. Um, and so the things I'm reading are kind of thinking about that, I guess. Um, so the first one is, and these are all, uh, you can think of these like uh, sequences in a poem or a writing or a short story or something. First one is dark matter. It's 2001 and the sky is falling in New York. I see the dark for the first time. You hold my hand until our parents come and get us. It's 2005 and black people are drowning in New Orleans. Kanye says the president doesn't care about us, but I'm sure if you, I'm not sure if you and I believe them yet. I see the dark once more. It's 2008 and Barack Obama is president now. We yell, my president is black in school. My grandma calls him a light. It's 2012 and Trayvon is killed alone in the dark. It's 2012 and Trayvon is killed alone in the dark. In the summer after, we watch fireworks. I see the dark depart and just for a second, I see the light leak on through. Biometrics. Diabetes is a disease that isn't technically hereditary, but is particularly prevalent in black families. It's linked to high blood sugar, and if left unchecked, can lead to deterioration of the heart. Earlier this year, I went back to my grandparents' house. The black drawstring bag my grandmother used to hold all of her pills still hung in the kitchen on the same broken chair she left it on two years ago. You always told me to speak with my whole chest. I guess you meant my heart. Commodity. 
Now I'll tell you about my favorite pair of shoes I ever owned. Well, that was a pair of white forces my stepfather brought me my freshman year of high school. How I walked with my toes pointed up in them to avoid any creases or the patterns of the butterflies in my stomach trace when my crush told me that she liked them. My stepfather's shoes were always brown or black. On days when he wasn't delivering packages for banks, he would work on cars out of our garage. He always smelled like oil. His hands were always stained. I discussed my white forces about a month after I got them. That's it. Thank you. Next, we have Heather. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I'm Heather Snyder Quinn. I go by she, her. Um, I'm going to start by reading one definition that is, uh, though it's short, it's very difficult for me to read. And then Tristan uh, will talk about our collaboration. So hold on one second. Uh, this definition is called debt normalization. Realizing that as a child, I normalized answering the phone for my father's creditors. I even knew, knew some personally. My favorite was a woman named Mary Mack. She was from American Express and called almost daily. My father avoided her calls by having us answer the phone to tell her that dad was busy. Um, so I'm gonna have Tristan talk about our project, um, but that sort of leads into it uh, because I defined capitalism. So we did a little um, poem on, uh, a collaborative poem on looting. I'll share what it looks like here. And so we did it in an exquisite corpse style. So the poem that is underneath is one that Heather wrote about sort of capitalist looting. And then the poem that is uh, seemingly spray painted on top is the words of a protester in one of the most recent protests uh, speaking out on the justification of looting in the failure of the police. So I'll let Heather uh, speak on her part first and then I'll read the second half. Okay, so um, my poem is called Capitalist Looting. And what uh, you can see underneath the exquisite corpse is I have sort of um, reflective writing from collective uh, text messages on one side. And then on the right um, are footnotes called Exhibit A that are examples of capitalist looting on Facebook. So it talks about, uh, about the hundred things that they use to surveil um, and sell our data. Capitalist looting, capitalism, I had to Google it, which says so much about everything, about who I am, where I am from, and the era in which I live. I, not you, or even the collective we. I started this line of inquiry with I. I'm not so studied in the isms of things, though I wish to be. I started to write a poem from my own perspective, of course. I was raised to be an individual. Who am I? Capitalism is rooted in individualism, or perhaps faux individualism, homogenous individualism, branded individualism, corporate individualism, templated individualism. I am user data pro profile 01010110, and I would like to report the looting of my property. My data was stolen and sold to numerous parties. There are no individuals in capitalism. We are all part of a drop-down menu of choices of who we can be, aspire to be, wish to be, want to be, possibly could be, are expected to be, or never could be. It's never enough to just be. When I was a brand strategist in 1996, we always asked, if you were a car, what car would you be? We didn't ask, do you need a car? Does the world need another car? Can you afford a car? Can you borrow a car? We assume everyone aspires to be a car, or rather a brand, a brand that already exists. Today, 24 years later, I sit attempting to rephrase the question, if you were a car, what car would you be? I've deleted my attempts three times now. I don't want to be a car. Um, and I'll read the the part that's on top. So these, uh, these were the um, somewhat paraphrased uh, words of a protester on a news report speaking out against the recent looting. And so they said, there's a social contract that we all have that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. 
you broke that contract when you killed us in the streets. And so it's sort of just this juxtaposition of looting being a result of the fact that the, the rules that were abided by to stop in the first place were never followed equally by both sides. And there were many definitions that were also in the readings uh, in the dictionary about looting sort of being this breaking point, this outcry by people, the loudest voice that can be heard by the population. And I think that's definitely what this protester was trying to emulate here in this moment. And that's it. Thank you. Hey y'all, I'll be going next. My name is Alona Altman and I'll first be sharing some poems, um, definitions that I wrote. And then secondly, I will have um, a collaborative poem written with Tash and then another collaborative short story written with a couple of my friends here, Cameron, Tash, and Miranda. Okay, so let's go. Um, all right, so the first one is called Hardware. Hardware, constructed in some of its smallest parts by circuits that open and close. Open circuit, the electrons cannot move in a circular motion, zero. Closed circuit, the electrons are rushed around and around, one. Ones and zeros, this language of a constructed binary held together by wire and electrons. Electrons operating in a black and white format, a format to maximize their labor, the circuit like ideology, the hardware like software, like interface, like ideology, black or white, but they say their true nature outside these circuits we have built for them to travel through is mysterious. They say you cannot know both the location, position, or momentum simultaneously. They are creatures without definite position or momentum. They are a possibility, perhaps. And then this one is called um, private ownership. So the idea that someone with our same bodies made of rainwater or a group of people can own a thing completely, associated words, yours and mine, other thoughts. An anarchist once told me beautifully that maybe we protect private property more than each other. And maybe we can live in a way where we only really have what we need at the moment. We can live in a world where we can receive what we need from each other, give to each other. There is no need for mine when all is ours. And then the, the last one of mine before we move on to the collaborated stuff collaborative stuff is um, called exhausted. So exhausted. Using up too much of the inside, heart flashes back to when they kept outside the land that's now yellow bare, leading to where, and when is it time to dream? Let's all go now, nourish each other with food and drink, and get some rest. Okay. And then um, I'll be reading Guilt with Tash. Um, so, Guilt in a Predatory State. And so it goes, covered in blue, has eyes that can wrap around skin, branding it red hot and so lasting, forever and ever punished and always guilty for. Who is guilty for what now? There is an internal white gaze, but it's not enough to stop. Guilty. And all those civilized in their blue suits, like drowning men, pushing down other bodies to stay afloat. What they perceive are antagonistic waters, though they won't say it, filled with fear, blood red skin flesh, punishable by death. Guilty. A life without, a sentence ending with a future punishing for. And with those eyes told me when it said, fill my face, blood red, flesh black, guilty for, you knew before I got here, being. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And then um, we'll move on to a collaborative story with Cameron, Miranda, and Tash. And Cameron, can we'll start. Okay. Um, this is called Terms and Conditions. Um, and we'll be switching off as we go. We covered our faces, but it wasn't enough. The matrix was all, the matrix was all around us, and its eyes saw everywhere. Now, I'm not sure how we got here, but I'm pretty sure we always have been. And then, how can we build ourselves when it already feels like they've done everything for us? Seeing, we began to wonder if maybe there was power in it. Maybe we can see through the hardware, find a way out, and make ourselves anew. We know we have to do work internally as we learn and unlearn what it means to reveal your personal data to you. We recognize our features and information are not exhausted or any close to complete. We invite you to reimagine and contribute resources that could normalize the system. Touching, smelling, and hearing. We encourage you to sense what a soft wear may emphasize with you. We adapt collectively as we press on. Together, we meet in old janitor closets to collectively imagine a new path forward in this world of the matrix panopticon. Sometimes we walk through its streets together, simply notice and listen to it. With this, we begin to understand that to each person, the matrix presents itself slightly differently according to what variation of its ruling ideology is most palatable to each of us as individuals. The matrix was feeding us all different worlds, telling us to pay attention to different parts of the street, showing us the ads that fed our hopes and fears and reinforced a sense of isolated self. It uses algorithms to construct our desires and thus control our actions. And so, Almost with the clarity that falling into sharply cold water brings, we understand divide and conquer to be the secret impulse behind the matrix. We know now what we must build to regain our collective liberty. And in an effort to build a new lens, we ignited our innate power through the realities of what's within us. We started by creating a network rooted in what lies beyond the matrix and additionally our physical shell, a system reliant on what we're made of, matter. We created a shift from the codes of conduct and standards of being that previously pushed us into precarious corners of humanity and co-opted and scrambled the various information technologies made to police and extinguish our bodies. As a result, we developed a complex software to fuel and sustain the machine herself through our own thermal energies disengaging from the power of the matrix and re-engaging naturally to rebuild ourselves and Mother Earth. Thank you, that's all for me. Thank you guys for sharing. Hi, <laughs> I'm Crystal and um, I'm gonna share a couple of my um, writings which were kind of based on my experience um, having gone through polar identities uh, post-colonialism being a student being broke being in academia so my the first one is um it's called human and it's meant to let me share my screen actually it's easier it's it talks about um like the the faults of ai i guess um since i'm involved in that um, it's automating guilt, automating race, automating indebtedness, automating the imagination and potential of a people, their hopes and dreams, their purpose for living, automating their future with algorithms, optimizing the fate of others who have little power in the system, who have no choice but to deconstruct those algorithms. Like the algorithms, they self-organize. They protest for a future that includes their hopes and dreams, that does not discriminate that gives them a future where they have a voice in making, not in automating, the human in these algorithms. And the next one is on assimilation. Um, assimilation to me is to deny one's own identity, to appease white fragility, 
to mute oneself to exist as a ghost. In California, which I lived in for 10 years. Um, California is a great place for business owners. There's a lot of cheap labor here. Um, <laughs> California, I call it the belly of the beast. This is one of my professors said this. Um, California is a place of nomads. Everyone here is on their way to somewhere else. And California is a place of exploitation and broken dreams. It's a place of struggle. It's a place where someone's fantasies can become another person's nightmares. It's a mirage. And um, this is a work that I did based on, I used to work as an electronics technician. So it's based on some not gates, but it represents gent uh, gentrification. So the ohms represent people with lower incomes and the not gates are literal gates. So it's a schematic diagram that shows redlining um, and finally, I wanted to leave with this. So all of us have a story. We are the experts of our experience. Exotic means non-white or fetishized non-whiteness. It is a term that gives power over the value of non-white personalized experience and relies on whiteness for validation. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, my name is Leanne Wagner, uh, she, her. Uh, I just want to share a diagram that I made. Bring it up. And um, as a designer, I've done a lot of sketches and things that like help me sort through some of the thoughts and ideas that we've had throughout class. Uh, and this is kind of an analogy for a panopticon. Um, so thinking about how social platforms or databases, hence the shape of the cylinders, kind of trying to mimic databases, are a type of modern day panopticon, watching us and collecting information to be sold to surveillance and capitalist efforts. So the police database cylinder representing obviously police and the dollar sign representing like capitalist ventures or efforts. Um, so you can kind of see this flow of uh, the line work that comes in and out. So I think that's one big thing that like trying to kind of ca capture that in some visual way and like, I don't know, solidify it in my head, this idea that I, I use Facebook as the central like panopticon tower, but I think you could substitute that with, you know, literally about anything at this point. But the way that it's kind of constantly observing us and taking in our data and then the pink lines represent data flowing back out into surveillance and capitalist efforts and then green lines representing money going back into these um, panoptic towers like Facebook and things like that. So I think that's like part of what I was trying to kind of capture is that flow of data and money that goes on. And then this other idea is um, through the social platforms also control our view of the world. So taking our information and feeding it back to us through a lens of algorithms and capitalist uh, perspectives into kind of our own personal echo chambers. So those kind of pink lines on the top are representative of the data or kind of the information that this Facebook panopticon tower is kind of feeding back to us. And the only view that we really have is through those windows of what they kind of show us kind of representing our streams um, in social media and things like that. And I, I've just I've done a lot of thinking about how social media affects our, our how we form our ideas and perspectives just this over the course of this from this course and just from personal things with my family and other folks trying to have conversations outside of this class and how this I just really feel social media is really influencing a lot of it at least with some of my family members and things it's been really difficult and just trying to kind of I don't know capture this and understand it in different ways has been um, impactful and like I don't know somewhat solving in my head to some degree to see this stuff represented in this way. Um, so yeah, pretty simple, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's all I really wanted to share today, but thank you. And there we go. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Julia Nisaye and I grew up in Tenochtitlan, Mexico. And 
I'm just gonna read something. Okay, so first definition, uh, matriarchy, a government system steered and regulated by a council of women, align and imbalance with the people and the laws of the land, the root of their fear. Private ownership, the original looting, a pathological lack of humility that creates delusions of grandeur of our mother nature. Survival, the daughter of resistance. To learn about the history of injustice is also to learn how much we have been loved by our ancestors. How many people in your lineage resisted for you to be here? Heavy, heavy, heavy love. Um, yes, yeah, so these are some uh, codex, um, uh, Mendoza Codex, which it's a white person's name. So they basically stole our codes and then um, they named it about themselves. Um, but yeah, it's not Mendoza, but this, this is our code. Um, I'm talking about the, about the Mexica. Um, so this is called uh, Codex Mexica. Uh, maybe if I learn how to reverse engineer, I can read the code of my ancestors. The scholars study are outsiders, European names I can't pronounce. They have little respect and understanding for us. They have no humility. The more I connect with the land, the more I can read them. The Cree and mission of it have taught me about their drums, the medicine of the heartbeat. They have also taught me about cedar and sage. They have taught me about the seven grandparent teachings. <clears throat> the son of a prophet from the Harter Island came an offering of copal. Oh, shit. Um, oh, yes. He said, I don't know why I need, I don't know why, but I need to give you this. He's 19. He has ran four times from the head, Alaska, to the tip of the, of the tail, Panama, of Terra Island. What are the odds? Why am I getting this message? Being of service to indigenous youth in the North, I have received more than I, I have given. <clears throat> We're in this journey of revitalization and healing together. The more we talk and share teachings, the more we see that we're family. Cousin, I can now see the copal from Guerrero on the codex, the medicine from my ancestors. I can now see our beautiful drums on the codex. I used to think they were only circles. I had, I had to come all the way to the north to learn about myself. Sometimes the further you go, the closer you get, the closer you get. Thankful for this journey, all my relations. Um, do you should believe for your teachings? Um, one second. That's it. Hi, everyone. My name is Miranda. Uh, my pronoun is she and her. I'm calling from Toronto, Canada. Um, I will share screen with you guys. So I just will be reading um, several definitions that I've learned from this class with amazing folks. Um, firstly, I'll be sharing a uh, annotation of a feminist history of the internet in New York City. In the lower Manhattan walk toward led by Jessica, uh, sorry, Lydia Jessup, who's a creative and public interest technology. Just Lydia shares the story of seven women pioneers who were instrumental in development of computing and the uh, internet in New York City was her question of, what would a feminist internet look like? I speculate the connection between the web girl, which is a way for women to meet other women who were interested, sorry, interested and knowledgeable about the internet and the narrative of democratization of programming. The stories of feminist radical support networks, interdisciplinary collaborations, and maker communities seem to liberate and democratize the control system embedded in early computer programming. It offers the imagination to co-create caring, empathetic, gender-neutral, and more accessible cyberspaces and to 
and interactions. And here's a reference. Computer visual culture. So culture ensures an admin agency of programmers in designing the visual construction of a computer device. The culture hides infrastructure of hardwares and creates obligations of functionality of a computer. Um, and uh, ecological wealth, a value that people impose on natural resources that are found scarce compared to the volume of other Earth's resources. It's a lack of knowledge and information about materials. People consider the scarcity as the wells of the Earth. And I really like this term um, that on the left, um, I, that was the definition uh, made by me. And on the right, it was def the definition was defined by my father. Um, he says 47 years old Chinese, and he tried to understand colonialism through a lens of the lens um, that's being colonialized in China and his own understanding of um, colony of the world history. So I'll just be sharing my first. Um, colonial colonialism, an example of action reaction force pairs as a pro, um, propulsion of one party imposing their ideology and practicing authority over other people. It results in an unbalanced force, the unbalanced force that has been enforced on indigenous people later results in the shift of labor, reserved cultural practices, lifestyles, and uh, uh, conversion of the land. Theology of colonialism results as a stigma that affects the indigenous people in the land and ecological balance. My dad's uh, definition is that colonialism is an aggressive predatory behavior in which colon uh, colonized people are the victims of the extending practices of authority selfishness and cruelty of colonizer. Colonialism also affects native people significantly as colonizer occupying the lands that does not belong to them, as well as the negative impact of ideology of imperialism to the descendants of indigenous people. That's it. I'll pass on to other people to share. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. Uh, with you is Sarah Khalid. Uh, I talk to you from Saudi Arabia. And I usually define myself as an Arab and Muslim, and these like two uh, identity factors um, is what I'm trying like to bring to the discourse of like technology um, and design as well. So the thing between, um, I think what's, uh, it's happening like uh, between us and the West or as um, whatever is happened like in this different side of the globe is just the separation of language. Um, although we are like uh, also uh, colonized in, um, in a certain way, but we still like have this gap in between uh, our history and heritage and uh, the West history and heritage and I want to start with defining the computer just to think of a, um, to rethink actually uh, the term of computer and how we perceive it as an Arab so I'm trying here to define it literally so computer in Arabic hasub pronounce hasub the thing that calculates from root letters ha sa which derive words for, and I mentioned a couple of words. So in Arabic, words that share the same, uh, the same root have the same uh, sense of meaning, uh, even though they might, may, might be like uh, identifying different objects or different things. So the first word is husban, 
to count, also to carefully manage, to plan with precise calculation. It also means thunder, sleet. Hisab, to count, a satisfactory abundance, mathematics. And it's actually also mean the day of judgment um, in Islamic um, teachings. Ahsab, made enough. Giving until the given says that's enough. So it's like when you um, when you're giving me something and I want to say thank you, that's enough. So I say, Ahsab, Hasab, the honor of ancestors, legendary and integrity. Now, as I said, for Arabic speaking users, uh, rarely ever it's referred to to the computer, the machine with its translated nouns. So we don't call the computer hasub we rarely do that so what we what we call it is just computer uh, with like um, a thick b and and this being said so the all these like concepts that i mentioned we don't associate with this machine and we also don't associate the um, so in english so it's compute to compute and then it's computer so like the thing and then the one who's behind it who's doing it but here it's like, uh, it's never suggests that there's an, uh, a person behind this machine, a person who created it, a person, you remember like in the, uh, our first classes when, when computers were like the women who are plugging in things. But uh, in Arabic, we, it, this history is kind of omitted uh, and we just look at it as a virtual machine and it's just created this very um, vague and bizarre uh, realm. Uh, and again, creating this gap between like uh, between us, like the Arabic users and the computer. Another definition I want to uh, um, touch upon is that uh, it's uh, uh, inspired by Baha Abdurrahman. Baha Abdurrahman is a Moroccan um, philosopher, and he has a theory on media and communication. And I just use that uh, theory in this illustration. I'm trying to juxtapose two two terms. So it's the term of ID, like ID is being uh, the new definition of us as users. So what's your like Facebook ID or Instagram ID or whatever like technological ID? And this ID is being used against you to create this intimidation, intimidation, um, intimidate. Uh, relationship so it's like um, uh, how can I say it uh, breaking through your intimate moments or intimate information or intimate knowledge and just uh, missing with it and instead of being uh, your like personal territory being an intimate space it's like intimidating and I want to finalize with um, with the word that I think is uh, very fundamental in how, how, how to deal with technology in general. Uh, so the word is amana. And amana, Google translation did, didn't do it justice. So I tried like to define it here. So source word, meaning the state of being kept in trustworthy hands. In Arabic, there's this word amana. Google translation doesn't do it justice, so I won't truly say that these words depict intended meaning. In Arabic, there are root words, again, I'm referring to the same idea, which different words emerge from. These words can be translated into safe, secure, trustworthy, safeguard, and loyal. This being said, the, the antonym of this is violation. So when you violate someone, you're not like acting with a mana. So if I'm saying you are working with Amana, what I need to say is that you are safeguarding and securing what you are working with and being loyal and trustworthy of what you have in your hands. The last part, what you have in your hands, it's important to dwell on a little because it means as long as it's in your hands, be it yours or someone else's, or be it as it may, a communal asset, you have no right to violate it. And this was inspired uh, by the class when we were talking about resources and assets and mother nature. Well, in Islam, we don't have the idea of mother nature, but I want to present um, like an alternative uh, way of thinking about nature. So, uh, uh, so 
actually. I mean, so in the Quran, uh, God says, indeed, we offer the trust to the heavens. So the trust here is like the amana. We offer the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. And they declined to bear it and feared it. So we can think of nature as like opposing like to bear this uh, trust is just too much for it. But man undertook it and bear it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Tosh. Um, my pronouns are she, her, they. Um, I'm gonna share my screen for this. Um, so um, I'm from the South and I couldn't help but I chose um, higher level programming. Um, in defining this term, I couldn't help but kind of relate the term a little bit to, um, so I define it as a language of code that is inaccessible to everyday users and allows those in positions of power or who can afford to obtain the knowledge to language the ability to make advancements and direct the behavior and responses of new technologies. Um, and I couldn't help but think about the programmer's relativity to language and the individual with this, um, even though we're talking a little bit more about translating code to um, more concrete languages here. Um, and so, I started thinking first about me being from the South and my relativity from this term and um, my idea of a higher level programming language is the Southern hospitable language and how we speak and are with one another. Um, Y'all may be familiar with this. You may or may not be, I don't know. There's some code in there. Um, uh, but here also it made me think about um, I'm also very much into science fiction. And so it made me think about Samuel R. Delaney's book, Babel 17. Um, and that work is basically based on a code or alien language that the military can't break. Um, and the whole premise of that book is around the Saffir Wolf, Wolf theory, which is a linguistic um, relativity hypothesis that states that an individual's thoughts and actions are determined by language or languages that, indivi that the individual speaks and the words of a language that thus define not just what you say, but what you think and do. And so I created this illustration to go along with my definition um, as a translation, translation of that word in relation to the concept. Um, and here, uh, I guess it's relating uh, what we experience um, interacting with software to um, the programmer's relativity to language or not, and their relativity to other individuals, or lack thereof. Um, and then going into my next term, um, I'm going to do it from Marina because it's easier for me to see. Um, but the next I uh, defined was gratuitous violence, and I defined it as, I defined what gratuitous um, violence is a result of, and I put it is a result of the colonizer's obsession and fixation with the other and blackness, creating an internalized hatred of one's own self, whiteness, and the drive to assert oneself as superior through implementing violence in oppressive systems of logic. Um, and my illustration is uh, very much rooted in um, the Afrocentrist uh, psychiat psychiatrist, Francis Wells um, Kresley's um, uh, color confrontation theory. So her theory is more origin based. And that's kind of how I wrap my head around gratuitous violence because it's so stupid. Um, and so having this origin context gives it a little more sense, um, whether you believe in this or not. Um, and so this is an illustration of Francis Kreza's color confrontation theory, um, translated via stones. Um, and it's just a little comic strip that kind of goes through each step of the theory. Um, and then for my last um, text, I have a little bit of prose that I wrote about fetishism. 
um, and my experiences working in the techs, uh, the tech industry um, and how I uh, feel that technology firms and companies kind of fetishize the black aesthetic. Um, and so here goes. I remember the first day I met Blank. He hired me because I was a referral from a cool art friend, a college friend, not really a person, not really a mutual one as I never truly met that person. Although he never met me or seen my work, they hired me because I appeared to be an intelligent by their means and chill black girl. And I likely felt, and they likely felt I would blend into their culture well. Overall, they wanted my aesthetic, but not enough to hear me. Things were good when I was compliant with their processes, but not when I shared my expertise. They used phrases like, we want you to own this, but push me to be more agreeable in my research and developments. Anything short of conforming to the standard systems of design or not done in reference to models of industry experts was illegitimate. When I began to set free, set myself free, I became more and more cornered by the, their action plans, one-on-ones, performance improvement plans, the aggressive and resentful behavior and retaliations. That North Star that they claimed to so, they claimed to so openly encourage became an, an enforced doctrine of ambiguity used to push me out. The reality of the culture they desired began to close in on me, and then it did. Thank you. I don't know how to get back to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> so stop me. Hi, um, mine is Teresa Snyder Stein. I go by she, hers. Um, I believe I'm on the Lenape territory also. Um, oh, geez. Um, I was interested in, in so many different um, terms that we studied. Um, let me, I'll just go into lumpenization. Black and brown canaries in the charcoal mine quickly evolving technologies such as those depicted in sweat, Lynn Nottage's play, deleted union jobs all around the country, not just in Reading, PA, targeting workers on the factory floors, busting unions, creating a class, the formerly working, now poor, black and brown canaries in the coal mine. Political and economic forces fostering a debt economy expands into a debt state, jobs gone social services dwindling, squeezed for cash, easy credit, the slippery slope, non-neutral based algorithms building debt, incarceration on the horizon to generate capital for municipalities, the untainable behemoth just in waiting to pounce, just in waiting to pounce, black and brown lives in ruins like canaries in a coal mine. And this was written based on a conversation with Crystal Mahogans. Um, a new concept or a way of thinking about things was the body-borne camera, one of the things we talked about earlier in the semester, the, the term. Uh, an original te technology, my eyes and ears record, my voice and gestures play back our interactions. It's just an interesting new term. Um, another thing from the reading that was really interesting for me was job mortgage, um, a way to think about education. In Jerry Kaplan's book, Humans Need Not Apply, he suggested that one way to bridge the looming future unemployment gap due to technological advances is to use a financial instrument he described as a job mortgage. It's described as a way schools and industry can collaborate so that students can learn skills needed to fuel a particular industry. Financial incentives are offered on both sides to make this work. Students are not bound to accept a job offer and can change their minds or course of study, but this would theoretically be a way for a student to master relevant skills leading to employment after graduation. I wonder if this would work. We clearly need to make major changes in our educational systems and that he might be onto something. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Tristan. 
Um, I'm coming from Toronto, so I'm on land of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Onishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, and many other nations named and unnamed. Uh, the first term that I wanted to talk about that I wrote was trauma, which I wrote as a shared burden, old in ancestral lash scars left by lashes we all still bear. Then I related it to, I think of the salmon who swallows mercury only to be eaten by a bigger fish, who is caught by a bird, each collecting this toxin in them, despite their distance from the previous, the trauma of a broken system will continue until stopped. This makes me think about a lot of um, my, like, my parents and my friends' parents who carry trauma on them from home countries and from racism experienced in Canada, where I reside, um, and how that's passed on from their parents to them and then from them to our generation and thinking of how that affects us and also a responsibility that we have to try to help not carry that on to the next generation after or to make an effort to stop this mercury that we pass on through our bodies. Um, and the other term I wanted to talk about was an audio recording I had. I'll leave the, I'll leave the um, tag visible. I believe you can just, you can scan it like a QR code and um, listen to it here. But I talked about branding and I just wanted to sort of making a connection between the historical branding of black slaves as property by white slave masters and then the modern day definition of branding and how we strive as in a capitalist society to brand ourselves and how this all sort of ties back into this idea of ownership and selling selling oneself to a system of control um, and to come there if you're branded uh, if you're branded under a company like who, who does your work who does yourself belong to if you're branded for yourself what does that sale of one's own body imply um you can hear me talk about it more here but yeah that's what i that's all i had to say thank you for listening <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Tyler. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to share with you a few pairings of terms that I wrote. So the first one is determinism, um, skipping to the second part. Uh, software wants to insert or implement itself into all facets of life. This is evident in the way that startups, corporations, research institutions, hackathons, and academia have embraced and normalized techno-solutionism, which is the uncompromising belief that any and all problems can be solved through sufficient innovation and technology. Constant layering and growing, layering and growing, each time producing new problems, and then new solutions to those problems, and then new problems from those solutions. And then along with that, I want to talk about glitch, which I define as the artifact that emerges when an object of automation or computation built by humans cannot accommodate the vast range of unexpected human behaviors. Um, next, I'd like to talk about brand and neoliberalism. So similar to what Tristan talked about, um, a brand to me is a signifier or, or identification mark that denotes the property, product, or commodity as owned by an individual, or more likely a company or a corporation. Um, this emerges largely from this imperialist desire to claim ownership to property, to plant your flag and declare entitlement, and to expand your possession over more and more bodies, object, and land. Um, and neoliberalism to me is gesturing towards a culturally liberal ideology with one hand, while stealing and hoarding resources for yourself, especially from the working class and minoritized populations with the other. Um, a word that was new to me this, this summer is lumpenization, which I see as the uprooting and atomization of working class individuals 
from their former employment and economic status, and by direct consequence, their working conditions and location, which we're seeing is extremely relevant today um, in the midst of the pandemic and mass unemployment. Um, and then along with that, carceral logic, which is a mindset that justifies mass incarceration as a solution to poverty. Those who do not fit the image of respectability and innocence or who do not qualify as productive or useful to society are to be locked away, um, dehumanized, punished, and exploited for labor. Um, last thing I want to share is a short poem um, I titled Yields. So toppled monuments, toppled idols, printed, painted letters, tweeted virtues, offered symbols, ignored voices, then mowed coffee. If we survive this rotation, then what will we learn from this reckoning? Was this the end of a normal we inherited, end of an experiment we didn't design, end to the myth of credibility of the ones who claim to protect us? There went our health and livelihood and all the care that we needed from all the harms we've sustained carrying on with the weight of decisions made as children of the meritocracy, as products of the capital, as subjects of the carceral, hurtling towards our last moments, chasing the myth of productivity. Um, that's all for me, thank you. Hi, I'm Connor. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a critical technologist. Um, let me go ahead and roll in. Um, I hope everyone can see this. Um, maybe. Yeah, well, um, yeah, this is one of my first kind of like brain dump journal entries. Uh, I think this is after we read um, Wendy Chun's essay, um, which is kind of this really, um for me this like really just informative critique of software as ideology and as this tool for critique of ideology and kind of like a tool for rewiring all of that um and i kind of wrote this when i was um like i said when we first started the class and i was feeling like a real sense of urgency as everything kind of around us um that, that framed the class was starting to kick off as well um so there's some baraka in here i was also reading benjamin two people who kind of also have this um, like innate urgency in their work. Um, so to characterize my ideology as hate whitey is accurate since the only whitey is system and ideology. In the context of this week's readings, the quote above immediately brings to mind the foundations of the software ideology and white patriarchal violence. Baraka encourages us to see the construction of whiteness as an ideology in itself. A more concrete picture of weaponized technological critique arise by way of Baraka as well as Gramsci who noted in his prison notebooks that the term ideology was originally used to describe a science of ideas, only later changing to mean a system of ideas. And noting that ideology effectively becomes determined by historical, political, rather than physiological factors, Gramsci introduces the notion of ideology as terrain akin to that of a battlefield. Thinking of software and the narrative surrounding its history as a battlefield resonates deeply in my interest with taking direct action against digital surveillance practices and misinformation campaigns. Ideology informs as, and is informed by tradition, which is in constant danger of becoming a tool of the ruling classes, then you mean from theses on the philosophy of history, and the, th the same threat exists for software. Um, so I think, uh, this class was so important to me as a kind of like a direction or giving me a direction to kind of target like the structural integrity of, of the systems and ideologies we're learning about. Um, and so I guess the, the next thing that I want to share really quickly is the trust plane, um, which kind of grew out of conversations I had with classmates um, about Steve Mann's valence plane. Um, and we were thinking about how we might be able to uh, organize um, like a, a compass for trust and like what trust really is. Um, can trust necessarily like exist in the same space as um, surveillance or counter surveillance or any kind of valence? Um, so yeah, uh, just to summarize the right hand here, it's kind of just inspired by this orthogonality and the dimensions inherent to, to man's valence plane. Um, 
And I just kind of wanted to see if we can structure trust that way and, and what an antitrust would look like. So um, in the compass, we kind of have various icons for tools that um, operate on trust. So there's um, the encrypted messaging app Signal. Um, there's a kind of decentralized anonymity tool like a VPN that people uh, use to get around firewalls in places where internet access is uh, restricted. There's DAT, a decentralized um, tool for sharing a um, big database. I think it was originally made for as yeah, um, like a wonderful decentralized creative tool. And then uh, on the right here, we have coercive trust and I just kind of included a kind of uh, end user license agreement um, pop up, uh, which with like a pretty large scroll bar and all that. Um, yeah, so that's about all I want to share. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to the next student. Hey, what's up? I am the next student. Uh, my name is David, and I, yeah, I really enjoyed this class. We learned a lot of stuff, and I'm going to share my screen if I can do that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and I, I'm not at my part of the dictionary, so I'm just going to show it on Arena. Um, and I want to talk about transaction. Me and Paris actually wrote this thing together, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just read it. Um, and transaction. So this is from America's Dead Economy uh, that week. It seems that this idea that assumes that some things can be replaced with capital or another form of collateral, uh, a universal tit for tat, a constant reckoning of value. How much are you worth? How much is your day worth? How many days can you sit and wait for the judge or the system? We pay fees to be processed, to be assessed as a fee ourselves. Viewed as potential capital for the man writ large. Is it possible to remove yourself from the machine? Is it legal? Pay to play, pay to not play. The unattainable figures required to be free. Or are you not trying hard enough? Have you not grabbed the laces of, your rotting, of the rotting brute straps issued at birth and yanked? Have you no hunger for an honest day's work? They want help, they really do, but they have their own bills to pay. We all have our own bills to pay. This transaction brings to my mind Morgan Freeman in front of the Shawshank Review Board. And I've actually done like a little bit of just kind of like writing about it, about this scene um, and thinking about it. So if it's cool, I'm just gonna play a part of it and then talk a little bit about how it relates to what we've been doing in our class and, and how it, it's just changed this entire thing for me. Got to take it? Well, now, let me see. You know, I don't have any idea what that means. Okay, and so even in just like that little part of it, you have this understanding that maybe Red uh, has tried to answer that question before, but because there is no true answer and that the answer is this thing that's constantly moving uh he's he's kind of having trouble with it but also um what does it mean to regret something and is there a type of regret that's more valid how can that be measured um and so i think this also kind of relates to biometrics to me and sort of like the arbitrary nature of a lie detector machine and just how it's like that's not a real thing but people have just made it to say like this is what we think a lie is uh and this is what we think it is and this is what it looks like on this graph um i'm gonna play this though well it means you're ready to rejoin society i know what you to... think it means sonny to me it's just a made-up word so that part's really cool made-up word obviously just sort of what words are words all words are made up words. There's just so much meaning kind of in, in the opening part of this. And then he goes into a further monologue and you can find it in the dictionary, but yeah, uh, I think that's kind of most of what I wanted to share. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll pass it to whoever is next. Hey all, good to be with you. My name's Diana. I'm calling from Canarsie Land in Queens, New York. You see her pronouns. And 
For tonight, I thought I would share a poem that I collaborated with Kevin on. And Kevin, I invite you to chime in as you would like. I'll share my screen so you can see what we wrote. We read um, Jackie Wang's Carceral Capitalism. And a section that stood out to me was on settler colonialism. Uh, so I'll read this and then we can chat a little bit about it. Tethered to one another with roots in other places, you can instantly in untangle us. These arcs map the location of our bones, the creation of them, and the winding path we spiraled into. Crisscrosses, loops, morasses, jumping over, stepping on, hiding under one another. Pull taut, we cut into our own longing. These lines, the coordinates of stardust, entangled in place. So when, um, when I'd been thinking about what, what drives this impulse to want to own, this impulse to um, settle and take, um, something that came to mind was this notion that we are sort of all moving on top of one another and like and yet strung to one another because of this longing or this like unseated desire to to own um and from that uh and in that conversation we, with kevin we sort of drew out what that looks like um, which is, and Kevin, I invite you to step in here to share maybe a little bit more about how these lines sort of came to pass on the drawing and, uh, and what you see here. Sure. Um, so yeah, based on our conversation, I think we were trying to kind of unpack almost this sort of like responsibility and complicitness in cellular colonialism. And, um, I was kind of very heavily inspired by uh, an artist based in the UK called Adam Riches. And also just kind of, there's a very old sort of like drawing technique of just not loving, letting your pencil kind of leave the paper, just doing one single continuous line. Um, so just kind of using one line um, to string together all these different people kind of in positions of prayer um, to kind of like signal or, or, or kind of represent this um, process of healing, but everyone just sort of still um, jambled together. And, and it's, it's a very complicated thing because um, of, yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that I really appreciated about um, the way that you visualize this poem, I'll also need maybe a little bit about the process. We spoke about what, uh, about this definition um, I typed up a poem using some of the pieces of our conversation. So the first two lines are actually Kevin's words from our conversation. Um, I think also the last line as well. And then Kevin, you uh, visual put this into uh, visual. Um, and I think one of the things too that I'd want to know is we spoke somewhat about prayer. We spoke about how um, we are in relationship to land. We spoke too about our own backgrounds, um, our own immigrant backgrounds and what it means to come from place um, and from place that's not our own. And also this particular moment in which our own relationship to land is so fraught given that we're all now meeting virtually. And like, what does, what does that mean to be entangled um, through these technological wires. Um, so I, I really feel like a lot of that came through in the visual and um, hope you all get a sense of that too in, in the writing. Uh, that's, that's all I have to share now. Um, thanks, I'll pass it on to, I believe, Jessica is the next participant. Yeah, thank you, Dinah, that was really lovely, and Kevin. Um, so I'm going to share one little piece and then Seuss and I are going to 
share a little bit of a collaborative poem similar to what Kevin and Diana just talked about, our collaborative poem a little bit as well. Um, but I, I felt like, and I'm going to share my screen, and I can't do that and talk at the same time. Here we are. Okay. You're going to see all my notes. Um, that's really embarrassing. Uh, so here is a piece I did on false cult consciousness. And um, I feel I'm like feeling David and what David was talking about and an American artist and these ways of working around words and the the positioning of false and consciousness together for me felt very sort of um, hard to chew on um, in part because of the way that false sort of feels like a binary and this idea of consciousness is something that could be limited or that has fixidity um, and coming from a background in dance. Uh, sorry, my name is Jessica Reiko. She, her, my background's in dance and human computer interaction. I'm in Metro Detroit. Sorry, I forgot to say that bit. Um, but I, I was really struck by um, a piece called Floating the Tongue by Bill T. Jones, who's uh, sort of known in postmodern dance scenes, um, also known in Broadway. He's got a, he's got a quite a prolific career, but he has this piece where um, he sort of does stream of consciousness talking of his movement and it goes through multiple phases. And I was thinking about that in the context of, he was sort of doing it in the idea of thinking, this idea of um, not thinking or thinking. Um, and I was thinking of this idea of like true or false consciousness and these binaries. Um, so I'm just gonna read the rest of it because I think it contextualizes it a little bit. So a belief that consciousness can be false. I'm taken back to an interview with Bill, between Bill T. Jones, choreographer, and Roger Berkowitz, political studies scholar, and there's a link there to their um, conversation. They discuss the work of Hannah Arendt, and Bill says, we never stop thinking. What happens when you brush your teeth? What happens when you wipe your butt after going to the bathroom? Do you just disappear? I don't think so. If consciousness can be made false, who does, and this is my words now, if consciousness can be made false, who defines truth? What is, a, what is good thinking? What is truthful embodiment? Bill T. Jones dances the floating tongue. It looks like this, and it gives a link to an eight minute piece of him doing that. The task of the dance goes something like this, and this is sort of the structure of the piece itself, even though you can't see it. Phase one, keep a movement phrase, keep it simple, create a movement phrase, Keep it simple and don't think too hard about it. Decide when the phrase has a logical conclusion. Rehearse this phrase so that it becomes habitual and you don't have to think about its progression as you dance. Dance it repeatedly until you can remember and understand its rhythm. It should be under 30 seconds to execute. Phase two, imagine you're teaching a class. Dance the material and describe the movement simultaneously. Be as detailed as you can be. Describe each action, body part, direction, inflection, velocity as you do it. Phase three, do the material as purely as you can, but allow yourself to access regions of your mind or psyche unedited. Narrate the dance as you do it, but allow these unedited thoughts to enter. Try to keep your attention on the purity of the material while being as present as possible with the thoughts that emerge in relationship to it or in relation to it. Phase four, what you are doing affects what you're saying and feeling. What you are saying and feeling affects how you change your movement. Allow the movement to affect your internal landscape. Narrate this internal landscape and allow it to affect your movement. Return to the phrase as you continue, but allow it to happen organically. Leah Cox, a former company member of Bill T. Jones and Arnie Zane Dance Company. The dance looks something like this, starting around five minutes, and then there's a version of her doing the same piece. When I see both dance, I see how we try to, hard to make tangible the inner urges while also refusing to make it something to hold, stand through fingers. So that's that. Um, and I thought it was just interesting to reference dance in that context and feels like an interesting segue to what Susan and I did together because it also followed sort of a semi-rigid format and structure to get at something. So Sus, I'm gonna pass it to you if that's okay. And I'm gonna stop sharing here once I can, there it is. Yeah, that's the perfect segue. Thanks, Jessica. Um, okay. So, um, Jessica, is it, I think it's organic. Uh, Jessica and I uh, were paired together to do a poem and 
through some discussion, we um, settled on this idea of prediction and uh, thinking through the, the concept of predictive policing and what it means to, to make assumptions about the other person without really actually knowing anyone out the other person. Uh, and so uh, we we th we talked a lot and we, we created this question. And we we thought a lot about the um, the structure of what predictive policing looks like and risk analytics and and how that data gets created. And it's through sort of these like format um, these very form driven uh, like very personless. Um, formats in the Compass uh, predictive risk assessment tool. Um, and so I created a, a Google form and we took some inspiration from the Compass uh, risk assessment uh, tool itself. A risk assessment tool is used to uh, decide whether or not a person is a good uh, uh, candidate to sit in jail or to be let free on, 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 those, on um, programs uh, through prosecutors. Um, and so we created this risk assessment tool to, to play with each other. Um, and we took uh, questions directly from that tool and then from this poem, 45 questions to ask while waiting. And we, and we did a really, you know, did it very diligently and we created uh, what you can see here uh, on this first panel on the, um, on the left uh, where we went back and forth and asked each other questions. Uh, we then, sat through class and we sort of had this moment where we realized that uh, the we really separated ourselves from the experience of thinking about predictive policing in such a way that was so heavily imbued with whiteness and sort of removing ourselves from the empathetic em empathic experience of what this incredibly heavy uh, term meant. Um, and so uh, we took another pass at this poem, which you can read later on in the publication. It's, it's difficult to read in this, in this capacity and sort of overlaid it with our own discomfort of self-realization of having done this, uh, of having used whiteness as a way to distance ourselves from the experience of the violence of a predictive analytic tool. Um, and so I think that there is a, a sense of dance imbued within it and sort of the playfulness of the way that the words uh, uh, kind of embody the cringe experience of, of that self-awareness. Um, and you can see it we go through there. Um, with that, I think that um, Jessica, we, we part of our writing in here as well as a conversation between us um, and with the point where we're sort of, that we are uh, stuck. Um, so I'm going to start off. Um, I think is that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Is that. Yep. At you. Okay. Um, uh, so. Uh, so thanks for this. I'm not sure, not totally sure what a CSV file uh, CSV file is, but this is a fun format. But from our conversation, I returned to a Wendy Chun talk uh, that I like. Um, Wendy Chun on habitual new media, and from it, I have the following thoughts. Uh, is our whiteness inherent in the usage of the Google Forms feature and the emulation of a carceral system? When we think about how to display our work, is it helpful to contrast the kind of, contrast it with the kind of risk assessment form we are playing with? I think that there's something uh, to the notion of a friendship questionnaire as you consider a tech not rooted in white supremacy. Chun talks about the prerogative to build technologies that question the basic premise that a memory should equal storage, that, uh, that everything read, uh, read in should be stored. Chun also spends a lot of time on the linkages and leakages that allow social media platforms to exist. Our leakage, who we spend physical time with, who we communicate with, etc., leads to the ability to have prediction in that space. Friend suggestions, you can tag a person um, in a photo, et cetera. In the same way, uh, uh, Wang's analysis includes a multiscalar approach, prediction of crime, of crime versus election prediction. What place do Facebook predictive algorithms uh, have in, in a predictive discussion? Um, going off that, Chun quotes uh, Eden Osu uh, Osucha, Historically, white women's claim to a protective, protected interiority receives the widest cultural sanction so far as white women are required to embody interiority for others. Uh, and Chun addresses this question of spatiality and embodiment. Um, in an era of network connections are habits. An edge, a connection is a, 
is spatial representation, a spatializing of a repeated and repeatable action. Behind every dead representation are vibrant acts of renewal in an era of big data, in an era of which correlation seems to trump causality, in which correlations are better, allegedly better predictors than causal relations. In an era of humes, things remain if they do habitually. Uh, a lot of thoughts and half thoughts, how to incorporate a meta poem hasn't revealed itself to me yet, but I'll keep tinkering. Also thought about physically suturing it all together. We'll see. And then I'm just going to skip to a short moment where I kind of respond back to a bit of that. And if you just want to stay there. Um, I'm also listening to Wendy and thinking about her use of circular repetition in words. It gets me thinking about repetition and refraining, saying things over and over in slightly different variations to get at the way an idea, beliefs, identities, biases, habits get nestled into a web of repeated actions, behaviors, and internalized patterns of thought. I think particularly because we're working on a poem, thinking about our choice of structure will be as important as the content. So this is just to give you a sense a little bit of how our conversation went and was folding some of these ideas together. And of course it's longer and <laughs> the metadata of that poem itself. Um, but I think that's where we'll end with that. And I see, and I apologize, I missed the QA as we were transitioning, um, but you're right, Kevin, you're next. And so I really look forward to hearing your answer as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Diana, do you want to go first really quick and just answer the Q&A? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin, for that question. Uh, you asked, what does it mean to you both, that's Kevin and I, to be able to call a place your own? Um, so just to quickly chime in, I'm not sure that I can call a place my own, but I do think that place can call me. And so um, I think that means that I am indebted or beholden to places that I've called home, my own birthplace. Um, and being beholden to place then would mean that I'm listening to, praying for, and tending to that land. Um, and so the sort of roundabout answer would be that maybe calling a place my own means that I'm in constant conversation with the place and the land uh, that I'm living on and that's sustaining me. So maybe it's not calling, but it's more the act of the listening. Yeah, thanks for that great question. That was super beautiful. Um, so my name is Kevin Peter He, and I go by he, him pronouns. To start off with answering that question, I think that's something that I still struggle with um, because I grew up moving a lot. Uh, I grew up like living in like six cities or so. So I feel like I've never been, and in very different cultures. So. Um, I feel like I still struggle with the concept of home and to be able to have sort of ownership over a community or, or land. Um, and I think that a lot of my work actually is um, kind of trying, for me, trying to represent that struggle um, of wanting to belong somewhere, but also sort of um, seeing the context in all the other places and feel like not belonging in anywhere. Um, but with that, I will share my screen and um, get into some of this stuff. Um, so I, I won't go over too much of this, but uh, Diana already mentioned this. This was kind of the drawing that we did um, that was kind of to represent prayer um, uh, with like a single line and how everything was kind of intertangled um the oh and to preface um i think as a sort of like a person with a visual arts background um i i found it more i guess like easier to express how i felt or the different concepts through uh graphic forms so that's kind of like how i mainly um contribute with my stuff uh the second quick drawing was uh, titled kind of a 21st century panopticon um, and we kind of talked about the concept of panopticon and how it surveils kind of people, um, but also kind of knowing where that gaze is coming from and potentially having the ability to hide from it. But in the 21st century, we turn to our screens constantly for entertainment. And I wanted to use just this kind of relatively grotesque imagery to kind of bring attention to um, how surveillance has really evolved and is almost sort of invisible in our daily lives and just next time when you look at your computer screen, if you like think about all these eyeballs looking back at you, um, it might be pretty creepy. 
Uh, the next one was kind of uh, on surveillance capitalism, um, which is kind of this, uh, you know, kind of our data trails are kind of gathered and assembled into, I would imagine, sort of almost these, almost these like voodoo doll, like alter egos in the digital dimensions. So this was kind of a self-portrait uh, of a photo of mine and then of myself um, that I like digitally manipulated to kind of almost like represent these like soulless, like fragmented shadow of ourselves. Um, and then the last one is on uh, epidermalization, uh, which is kind of a drawing on this sort of like internalization of um, sort of someone like living in this sort of like white world of developing um, kind of a shell that almost like corrodes him from within and being in this kind of like very like vulnerable, like introspective position. Um, but yeah, that is it. Hey y'all, I'm Lauren. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, today, Ryan and I are gonna be reading some poems from a project we made exploring the debt state across multiple levels from the cellular to the galactic. Um, Jackie Wang talks about the debt state as a state that covers a large rising part of its expenditures through borrowing, creating a public finance model where creditors are the privileged constituency, not the public. Um, and I was really interested in her exploration of indebted subjectivity as a means to predict future behavior and profit from it. Um, and Ryan, feel free to chime in at any point here. Um, but one of the things we were also considering was uh, this idea of mandatory debt and how it traps consumers in a cycle of it. All right, with that being said, I will share my screen. Uh, Has it been shared? No. begins here, this is the home state. If it's my fault, maybe I can fix it. Sorry, 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 sorry. My boyfriend calls it a sorry bazooka now, when I can't stop hedging. Really, I think it's more an assault rifle, automatic fire, a predictable stream of unrelenting submission to coax, automated indebtedness to stroke, manifest explosive opacity. I already knew the cipher. He who has the gold makes the rules. You always chuckled. This is the cellular level. A bright flash overwhelms my mitochondrial energy. Taking eager residence across the lazy river of our bloodstream, nanobots cluster together, erecting ATP tools. Just a breath and the energy currency of the cell, sanctioned and sorted for motion to determine where we're going. And so this is Ryan jumping in. Uh, welcome to the state of money where we have the best interest of money at heart. Who prints the money? Well, us, of course. If you'd like, we can sell you some debt, your debt, of course. Don't worry if you don't want any, we'll be sure to make some for you. Don't you know this isn't a zero sum game. It's a sum of sums that sum from sum to sum for sum. There's always another slice of pie. Don't you like pie? Our printers are already warm. I'm sorry, and this is a city level, I'm sorry, you'll have to pay the fine. There's nothing I can do. I don't make the rules. The budget was too tight this year. The ROI of those textbooks is less than this police car. We don't have enough jobs, but maybe if we offer tax cuts, they'll come, your tax dollars at work. We can go get some payday loans from that late neighborhood without any polling stations. No, it wouldn't be enough. Remember, we're all in this together. Um, and part of the idea with the project, too, was that it would mirror the debt cycle by creating this feedback loop between the poems. So you'll see here again, we return to the home level, um, and that'll take us to city again, uh, <laughs> navigating all between it. Um, and this is the galactic level. Jeff Bezos jet skied on a blazar yesterday. My aunt told me, navel gazing. They'd turned the oxygen off on her neighbor the night before. HD 18973B remains the cruelest of his colonies. 
indirect detection experiments still search for evidence of self-annihilation or decay of dark matter in space. Speculation affects, archive predicts. Having cataloged every wave particle from their vantage point to prescribe the atomic circuits of the future, oil titans mine the quantum abundance of the multiverse to build the galaxy's largest monolith, another empty condo on Saturn. This is like at Earth level, so go outside and look up. How blue is the sky? Do you hear that low groaning or is suffering only in faraway places? Do the bees have to die? Was this part of the manifest destiny? Why are the streets so hard when they run like rivers? Cars are the only thing flowing. Do you think there's anywhere else? Why do oil wells look like pimples and pipelines always pop? It's so hot. Where do you go? All right, and with that, I will pass it to the next person. Hey everyone, so we're going to take a brief intermission, very brief, like around five minutes, um, and then we'll continue with the readers. So you need to use the bathroom or get some water or whatever. That was a good time. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Michaela Bailey. I use pronouns she, her, and hers, and I'm currently a curatorial fellow in New York um, at the Studio Museum. And I'm just gonna go over some of the definitions that I've made over the past 10 weeks um, and talk about some of the collaborative projects that I've done with other students in the class. So my first definition is um, racial capitalism. And I defined it as a system of apportioning exploitability, humanity, and extractability along racial lines in order to subsidize whiteness as quality of life, as access to rights. My second definition is causality. Um, on causality and Achille Mbembe's necropolitics, where the colony is a space of exception. Just as the invention of the car created the possibility of the car crash, the practice of gratuitous colonial violence, reserved for the other and elsewhere, served as a condition of possibility for world war. And there's kind of like a caus causality map. So it goes, colonial violence against the other leads to subconscious or conscious precedent for mass cruelty against a human citizen within, leads to flouting of the old laws of war within Europe, leads to world war. Um, and this is a framework that was brought forth by Mbembe in Necropolitics. Um, that's where I first learned about it. This is a definition of a carte de visite. And I use an example of an actual carte de visite that was produced by Sojourner Truth. Um, and it, it's an image of her seated. Um, and the quote reads, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Sojourner Truth sold these reproductions of her image to finance her speaking tours in the 1860s. This definition of prototypical whiteness features a vintage copper tone ad um, it reads, tan, don't burn, use copper tone. And at the very bottom, it might be a little hard to see, but below the dog's feet, it says, don't be a pale face. Um, so my addendum to prototypical whiteness and this copper tone ad is um, normalcy embedded in what is marketed as necessity. A copper tone ad fe featuring a tagline, don't be a pale face. So here the unspoken norm is that without the copper tone, one would be pale. And I think it's an interesting contradiction because paleness is different than whiteness. Um, and this presumes whiteness in terms of who's using the product um, while simultaneously setting up an ideal that's not necessarily attainable for all um, white bodied individuals. My next definition is tax state. Um, and basically the existence of a tax state depends on the state being able to guarantee credit worthiness um, through its ability to extract from citizens at will, 
through property taxes and fines and other means. My next definition is anti-blackness. And for this, I just used the Google search results for unprofessional hair. This algorithm has since been changed, so the search results are now different. But a couple of years ago, there was an outcry at these results. Um, you can see that the results mostly feature women of African descent um, and hair that is not straight. Um, yeah. Oh, I did not mean to stop my share. Let me go back. So this is a trust map that I made with Connor and Timor or in conversation with them um, in the class. And we basically used um, Simone Brown's idea of surveillance and a surveillance plane. Um, and we riffed along like with that model along the idea of trust. So I'm basically tracking different forms of trust on a scale from coercive trust at the bottom to organic and affinity driven trust at the top. So at the bottom, you have convenient forms of consent, like the um, terms of service agreement, which you also saw in Connor's um, map. You have like the idea of a wolf in, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, and you kind of have the thin line between compliance and complicity. The terms in black are just different um, kind of um, modifying terms that also convey movement. So I thought it was fun or possibly generative to juxtapose those terms, um, different kinds of trust against those terms. Um, so you have interspecies trust. Um, that's like the trust I have between me and my cat. Um, maybe a more organic form of trust could be anti-surveillance efforts and with like solidarity as the heralded um, yet elusive ideal. This definition is of juvenile life without parole and I just state that it only happens in America because America is the only country that um, enforces this. Um, and then we have a definition of encapsulation and I'm showing a diagram of the life cycle of a wasp and how it relates, its reproduction relates to the reproductive cycle of a fig. Um, and so my definition is the wasp enters the fig and she does not leave. And finally, I'm going to end with a definition um, that was created by my father. I asked him to define the gold rush while he was watching, I think some sort of sports game. I'm just gonna play it from my phone and hopefully you can hear. Hey, Dad. Hey, what's the gold rush? What was it? Yeah. They discovered gold near San Francisco. my dad um, how many black people he thought were part of the gold rush. Um, he said that he didn't think there were many um, and because of racism. So I just kind of appreciated his casual structural analysis there. Um, and thank you. I'll pass it on to you, Makisha. Okay, last day of class and still talking on mute. Um, my name is Makesha, <clears throat> and I'm currently on um, Chichenyo land, also in South Berkeley. And um, I'm going to share two things of um, two things from the dictionary, and we'll share my screen. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna share is um, this image, and it's an image of a zebra losing its 
losing some of its stripes and the supposed caption of the zebra is, I think I'm having stress. <clears throat> and this was actually a t-shirt that I saw on a person recently. And we had been talking about this term epidermalization and I was in such a different environment and somehow that was still, it was on my mind. And so I think I'll read briefly what I wrote about that moment. <clears throat> At the pottery studio the other day with my hands in soft gray clays, little pieces of earth, my mind is on Fanon and epidermalization, the inscription of race on the skin. I've been thinking more about what it means if part of the condition of blackness is to know what has been written, <clears throat> carved, burned into our bodies, how the condition of blackness sometimes lives in the stress of what is being done to us. How do you archive the black body? My hands still in clay, someone I care about is wearing a black t-shirt with a graphic of a zebra losing its white stripes how to describe the expression on the zebra's face. The caption reads, I think I'm having stress. Can epidermalization be undone and can we unrace our bodies? I wonder what we can subvert when we know we are being watched and continue watching those who watch us. And can we unrace without being erased? Will we survive the undoing? And what if in the undoing we are no longer intact? Um, and before, before I say and share the second one, I wanted to also share that I chose to try to position myself under the grape leaves that are at my house and have been experiencing a lot, like all of this excitement around um, ecology and blackness and some of the ways, some of the relationships between those two things and just in honor of Simone Brown and the way that she talks about just some of the black fugitivity around grape leaves and pranks. I thought it would be fun to like put myself as close to that as possible. And there are figs here too. So Michaela, that can be for you. Um, which is a great segue actually into my second one, which is on the left here and is broadly about biometrics and was a reflection that came out of a conversation with Michaela where we were invited, I think just to be in conversation. Um, yeah, and just to feel in this dialogue mutually around Jackie Wang's carceral capitalism. And um, yeah, so, so much came up in that conversation. And this is just an excerpt from what we built together. Biometrics. And actually, I believe the original title was An Expanded Empathy, but I also know that we were never really tied to a lot of, um, never really tied to language in that project or in any of these projects. Biometrics. Remembering the instrumentation of hating my mother, the black criminal, she knows what she did and my friend said so too, told me how right I was to tell her she deserved to be in prison if not nowhere at all. I wonder if never visiting was a resistance, doubt it. Remembering how all of our languages are so disrupted, empathy disbanded, disallowed, no longer made possible. I don't remember when, where, how I learned to accuse you, but I remember the way it felt, like crushing a dead thing between my thumb and another finger how it felt like nothing but logic, cruelty as painful connection, the sociality of debt, what happens when the criminals become people again, become our mothers again, are we equipped to take the grief apart? How does empathy extend itself? What is disarmament? Will there be enough of us to grieve white supremacy, decimated desire, what's after hope? And that's me, and I will unshare and pass it on. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's 
So what I'm going to share today is the output from a collaborative um, working session with Connor, Lauren, and Jessica. And we were basically having this discussion about a month ago um, about if we designed our own software as a collective, what were the traits that we would want to give it? And I'm just going to read through these. Um, so the first would be no longer using optimization as a means of sidestepping offloading accountability, not sort of trying to move away from the ends justify the means mindset, um, questioning the ideologies and values of what we consider to be a functioning technology, prioritizing simplicity and avoiding the swift army Treating ourselves within a broader and more holistic definition of technology. Not co opting the word technology as exclusively digital. Each one of these ends impacted by their creation and use. Serve the needs of communities itself by being built with rather than for communities. Be specific about who is included and also excluded from design. Be homespun. Software that works on systems of trust and developed at the speed of trust rather in the speed of productivity. Develop with communities defined by the size of trust. Be clear about the limitations of what it does and who it's for. Understand that there is rarely a user, a single user, and that to design only one user rather than for communities of people impacts the social bonds we feel and we feel responsible for and to. Stop imagining technology and engineers as saviors, trying to work outside the white savior complex. Ensure the human infrastructures responsible for new technology have capacity to create systems that support distributed knowledge and multiplicity of imagined futures. Acknowledge that no technology is for everyone. Work within structural imaginaries that move away from binary and linear ways of knowing to cyclical, circular, elastic, and relational ways of knowing. Make power structures invisible. And finally, account for broader bodily and sensorial knowledge. Thank you. And I will pass it off to you, Paras. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Paras. My pronouns are he and him. I live in San Francisco. Um, so uh, I guess I want to share um, some of the work from early in our um, class um, with, it started with a piece we wrote by Wendy Shun, which was software's ideology. And um, one of the terms that, like two of the terms I guess I mentioned there were abstraction and user amplification. Um, abstraction being the ways in which um, you can make, you know, make certain decisions at a certain interface level and make decisions at a certain detail level and not really understand the bare details of what you're doing and to understand a higher, a higher abstraction. Um, one of the definitions I wrote about that um, was a user amplification. So uh, I wrote here, uh, the ability for computers to execute command, which has effects, which has effects that are much proportionally larger than the effort and scale of the user's request. The effects don't conflict with the user's intentions and make the user feel powerful and efficient. Uh, this was really early on in the class, and uh, I was thinking about these things that are mechanical level, and since then, I've had a much wider lens on people in the room who make the decisions on what to amplify. Um, what are the pieces of interaction that we want people to care about is almost directly proportional to what we don't abstract away from them. Um, and um, uh, oh, really, and, and this is just reminding me of like a cultural moment we had um, months ago uh, in a kind of unlikely place, which was Animal Crossing. Um, so uh, this is a, a little a little bit that I wrote then about Animal Crossing, which I'll read now. Um, a few of my friends have been really into Animal Crossing the past few weeks as it has skyrocketed in popularity. I found the gameplay mechanics really interesting as it seems to step away from many aspects of user amplification and instead require the player to manually do tons of small incremental tasks. Tasks which in some way are the immediate kinds of things that as a programmer, I'd want to automate. Uh, for example, when I see an item on the ground um, and it's surface higher than where I am, I have to walk next to it, open a menu, take out my ladder, put it down, walk up the ladder, and then put the ladder away. Only then can I walk up to the item and pick it up. Many really think about what uh, I come to expect in the software, which is that when something is clearly defined, the computer should handle the mundane aspects and instead leave me with the parts that are exciting. 
The problem with this is that I'm holding an implicit definition of mundane, which I can't really articulate if I want a higher level of amplification, then why stop at the mechanics of the ladder? If, this, if the game sees an item within my eyesight and is on the surface reachable by walking in the ladder, should it just automatically take control and go through the motions of traversing and picking up the item, saving the key presses, or more so, should it just scan the island and do this for all items? At this point, the game stops being fun and reminds me how much better I'm identifying tasks to perform than the excitement that I desire. Um, again, at the time, I was thinking about this in a very mechanical way. Um, and now, through maybe the lens of the class and through the readings, I, I almost want to imbue uh, a lens of almost radicality into that interface. Um, like what Matt was just saying, so much of global capitalism is the ways in which we're able to offload accountability and offload the externalities of the decisions we make. And when I look back at this, isn't this a way to say, no, you can't offload any of this. Uh, this is all right in front of you. You must do all of it. Um, so yeah, it's just a, I just, this is kind of a, a lighthearted way to think about this and um, a reminder of like, what are ways in which we design technology in our society that um, make it really clear the effects of your actions and what kind of structures and what kind of radical technology can we make um, that like thinking about the true externalities and effects of their actions. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, cool, I'll jump in. Uh, my name's Ryan, uh, go with he, him pronouns. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is read one of my definitions and then talk about some of the readings we did because I enjoyed them so much. Um, and the definition I wanted to read was for a white racial frame. Uh, what I put down was a framing of race that exists through the forceful framing of other races as inferior or refusing to evaluate itself. And I don't think it's a perfect definition, but um, I really like the readings and the ways that they inform this. Um, one is a quote that Simone Brown included in her book, Dark Matters. It's something that Robert Park said at a sociological society in 1918, um, that I think is like basically the frame. So I'll just read it. Um, this is Robert Park. Um, the Negro is by natural disposition, neither an intellectual nor an idealist like the Jew, nor a brooding introspective like the East Indian, nor a pioneer and frontiersman like the Anglo-Saxon. He is primarily an artist, loving life for its own sake. And part of like what I got out of that quote, uh, like got out of this weird framing, but um, was thinking about power as the way that it like relates to it. Um, I think that like when you're thinking about colonialism and the ways that like a lot of these like racial things developed, um, framing Anglo-Saxon as pioneer and frontiersman like gives them the power and everybody else ends up being passive. And even if like you think that he's like trying to compliment, um, which was one thing that I had in mind as I was reading that definition. The other thing I had in my mind was um, something Ruha Benjamin talked about in Race After Technology. Um, where she kind of just talked about the blandness of whiteness. Uh, she talked about giving you an assignment around tracing the name of different students and how her white students would come and be like, this doesn't feel like it's about me. I can't really relate to that. Um, and it was something that like when I read it, it was something that I could resonate with my own history as someone who identifies as a white man. Um, there just isn't a lot of depth in the way that history has been given to me. Um, and she had a few like words that I thought were really powerful after that that I'll just read. Um, so this is Ruha Benjamin's words. Um, what appears to be an absence in terms of being culturalists works more like a superpower. Invisibility with regard to whiteness offers immunity. To be unmarked by race allows you to reap the benefits but escape responsibility for your role in an unjust system. Uh, and so I was thinking a lot about that quote, uh, especially as like, I think Americans focus a lot on guilt and just the way it uh, um, exists in all of this. So um, yeah, those are the things that were like really informing the way that I was thinking about that definition. I think that Ruha Benjamin also did a really powerful thing in my mind that did this blandness to the ways that our technology presents itself as being neutral. Um, and that was something that I think was like really powerful for me to think about. Um, if I think about even just like the framing of like, however you're seeing me through the webcam and like hearing my voice, you're thinking of it as being something that's kind of neutral. Um, but there's a lot of things that are kind of built up into that. And I think that the way that Ruha Benjamin like looked at that was really powerful. Um, and, and she talks about it with AI, which I think is really interesting if you follow it, because there's like a new AI model that's come out that people are like all thinking is magical, um, instead of looking at like kind of the data that's coming from it. Um, and even like the Apple store aesthetic is being like super clean and pristine. Um, it, it, there's a lot of things that feel neutral. Um, but once I started to kind of think about it, I thought it was really interesting. And I think that one of the things from this class that I'm taking away is just kind of looking at things that 
try to be neutral in where they're coming from. I think one that like doesn't take much to look at to see that it's not neutral um, is like government stuff. Uh, and so from one of our class discussions, we talked about um, it's kind of like bureaucratic forms and how the census had been uh, racialized over time and how it had changed. Um, and I made like a little website that I'd like to walk through um, as part of that. So I can share my screen now that I've talked a bunch. And then, um, and it, it's basically coming out of my feelings about kind of filling out bureaucratic forms and how kind of weird it can feel, how objectifying it can feel, how uncertain I am about like if I'm doing it right, um, many things like that. And so it's pretty quick, but I'll say, hey, yes. How are you? Yes. Who are you? Yes. Does this matter? Yes. Do you pass? Yes. Thank you for completing the form. Um, and so yeah, that was just like part of me thinking about how weird bureaucratic forms feel to me. Um, and with that, I'll just pass the mic. I think it's me. Um, I've already talked a bunch, so I'll just share uh, one last thing. Um, I don't remember how to do this. Um, I've already talked a bunch about the um, poem that Jessica and I put together, but just uh, one last thing, um, something I see every day. Um, Again, a call back to Ruha Benjamin, and then often discussing the idea of, of benches and their way and their place um, in the weaponization of architecture and of urban space, um, and our our useful illustration of discriminatory design. Um, and she has this quote: "Yet if we consider race as itself a technology, as a means to sort, organize." and design a social structure, as well as to understand the durability of race, its consistency and adaptability, we can understand more clearly the architecture of power. Um, and as we think about going forward and thinking about this class, this is a space that I, this uh, little bench of resistance is something I just see all the time and I'm excited to meditate on it uh, every time I see it. So with that, that's all I got. Thanks, Suze, and thanks everyone for presenting. That was amazing. Um, I love seeing the connections between all of the things we've read, all the conversations we've had, and how it sort of manifests in these different forms of poetry and creative writing and essay and description, and, um, and also even listening to others to write some of these definitions. So that was awesome. And I'm also really thankful for everyone that could join and watch the stream. Appreciate you coming and listening. And again, if you're interested in the publication, we'll um, post about it once we know when it will be available. Um, the best way would be to follow SFPC on Instagram. So thanks again for tuning in. <laughs>